So welcome to the second session of Real World Crypto this year on symmetric cryptography. My name is Bart Pradil, and I have the honor to chair this session. Can you please take your seats? So the first talk is an invited talk. It's entitled Attacks Only Get Better, the case of OCB2. Talk will be given by Tetsu Iwata. All right, uh, thank you, Bart, for the uh, introduction. And uh, welcome back from the coffee break. My name is Tetsu Iwata from Nagoya University in Japan, and I'm going to talk about OCB2. Um, this is a joint work with Akiko Inoue, myself, Kazuhiko Minematsu, and Beltron Potri. The work was presented at uh, Crypto last year, and the full version was posted on the ISL ePrint archive. So this is uh, a penguin, a famous one. And assume that we want to encrypt this image with the ECB mode of a block cipher. So we have a block cipher EK here with n bit, n -bit blocks. And the image of the penguin is broken into blocks. M1 through MM here. And they are encrypted individually. And we obtain the ciphertext. The result looks like this the ECB penguin, and we vaguely see the shape of the penguin. So the ECB mode has issues. Uh, one issue is that if we have two identical plain, uh, message blocks in one message, then they are encrypted into the same ciphertext blocks, meaning that if we have two same colors, then they are encrypted into the same color. And this is the reason why we see the shape of the penguin in the ciphertext. The other issue is that if we encrypt the same message twice, then we will have the same ciphertext twice. So if we encrypt this image today, we will see this ciphertext. And if we encrypt the same message again tomorrow, then we will see exactly the same uh, penguin tomorrow. Uh, one more issue is that it doesn't provide authenticity of data, meaning that if the ciphertext is manipulated, there is no way to detect the manipulation, and the ciphertext is just decrypted into a wrong plain text. And in order to securely encrypt and authenticate data, we need to use an authenticated encryption scheme. So an authenticated encryption scheme is a symmetric key primitive for privacy and authenticity. We are interested in the NANS-based configuration of authenticated encryption, uh, formalized by Rogaway. And the NANS is the data that is changed for each encryption. So for instance, it can be realized by a message counter. Uh, in the formalization, uh, there is a concept of associate data that is not encrypted but authenticated. And this talk, uh, we will not consider associate data for simplicity. Now, Alice and Bob share a secret DK, and she wants to send a message M to Bob. She uses a nonce N to encrypt the message into the ciphertext and tag, and the tuple of NCT is sent to Bob. Bob decrypts it into the original message, or he outputs an authentication error symbol, or the reject symbol, if he believes that this is not originated from Alice. So this is a functionality of authentication. Uh, there are many A schemes. Uh, we have GCM and CCM from NIST recommendations. Uh, there are six schemes in the ISO standard. 
uh, IETF RFC includes GCM CHA-CHA-20 uh, Poly-1305. There are six schemes in the CESA final portfolio. And there are many schemes proposed to the uh, ongoing NIST uh, lightweight uh, crypto standardization project. OCB, offset codebook mode, is an authenticated encry encryption scheme. There are three versions. The first version, OCB1, was proposed by Rogaway et al. at CCS 2001. The second version was proposed by Rogaway at AJ Crypt 2004. And the latest version, OCB3, was proposed by Kravitz and Rogaway at FSC 2011. Uh, they are all NAS-based AE with associated data with strong features. Uh, they are fully parallelizable. We can encrypt one block cipher. Uh, it needs one block cipher code to process uh, each n-bit block, which means that the efficiency is very close to the encryption mo only modes like counter mode or the ECB mode. And they have uh, pr uh, proof of security. All versions of OCB have been extensively uh, studied, and uh, they all have security proofs uh, by Logaway et al., and there are many third-party analysis. And no weakness is known, and the security is very well understood. And I have a question mark. Our results, um, we point out uh, structural weakness of OCB2, the second version. Uh, the weakness is independent of the block cipher and its uh, block size. And this has been overlooked for the past 15 years. Uh, we present many attacks, authenticity attacks and privacy attacks, and all attacks are very efficient and the success probability is very close to one. About the practical impacts, OCB2 was one of the six uh, algorithms in the ISO standard, and they uh, decided to remove uh, OCB2 from the, from the international standard. SJCL, JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript crypto library, uh, implements OCB2. And uh, users may be affected, but we are not sure uh, if users really uh, use OCB2. Uh, we, we informed the, the issue to the team, and uh, we didn't hear anything from them, but we understand that fixing crypto is not easy and, uh, and time-consuming. Uh, this... Uh, Joplin is a multi-platform application for taking notes, and it uses OCB2. And they uh, decided to wait for the decision by the SJCL team. So let me go into the technical details of OCB2. We want to encrypt a nonce and a message into the ciphertext and the tag. So starting from this ECB mode, we have a nonce, and the first thing to do is to encrypt the nonce into L. So we have L here. L is not a part of the output, but we use L to generate masks. And we apply the mask to the input and output of the block cipher. We keep doubling the mask, and this doubling is slightly different from the usual integer doubling. But the most important difference is that uh, we use uh, XOR as the addition instead of the addition over the integer. Now, we see that even if M1 and M2 are the same, C1 and C2 will be different because we have a mask. And uh, this means that we will not see the vague shape of penguin in the ciphertext. And even if we encrypt the same message twice, we will see different ciphertexts because we have to update 
the noise and the mask will be different. So the issues of ECB uh, are now gone. And this uh, last message block is a little bit different. If we go back, this last message block goes to here. And uh, the last message block is encrypted in a counter mode. So we compute the length, bit length of the last message block, apply the mask, encrypt it, and we don't apply the output mask, and we have the ciphertext block. This is the checksum, which is the XOR of all the message blocks. We apply a special mask, which is multiplied by three, and we have the tag. How we decrypt? A couple of N, C, and T. We first compute the value of L. We now can compute all the masks, and we compute the block cipher in the inverse direction. Now we have these blocks, and for the last block, we decrypt in the counter mode. So we compute the block cipher in the forward direction to obtain an M. Now we can compute the checksum, and uh, we see if this matches with the received tag. If the equality holds, we have the message is returned. Otherwise, the reject symbol is returned. And there is a theorem uh, showing that the ciphertext and tag looks like a random string, meaning that the encryption is secure. And it says that forgery is not possible, meaning that it is secure in terms of authenticity. And this theorem was believed to be true until um, Inoue and Minematsu announced a surprising attack against OCB2. Their simplest attack is called a minimal forgery. And let me explain how it looks like. So Alice has a message M, and this M has to be a specific form of two blocks, and the adversary has to know the content of the message. And let's, let's assume that this is the case. She encrypts the message and sends NCT to Bob. This is a public channel, and the adversary learns NC and T. And at this point, adversary can create NC prime T prime that is not generated by Alice, but Bob accepts this as authenticated by Alice and returns a message N prime. Uh, this is called an existential forgery. So meaning that uh, this forged message probably means nothing, but still um, it, this is something that was not generated by Alice. So let me explain a little bit about the details of the minimal forgery. I think this slide is too technical, so, um, but let me try. If you don't follow this, that's fine. I hope that you have already got the, the high-level idea of the minimal forgery. So the first step is the adversary let the victim, Alice, to encrypt N and M, where M has two blocks, and the first block is the length of the N, bit, N zero bits. So we have n zero bits here, and m two is some anything, provided that it has n bits. Now c one, c two, and t is sent over the channel, and the adversary creates n c prime t prime, where c prime is a one block ciphertext, which is c one x or length of n zero bits, and the tag t prime is m two x or c two. And surprisingly, this will be uh, accepted by Bob. And let's see why this happens. Uh, we first see that this is the last ciphertext block. So this, we compute the forward direction of the block cipher to decrypt it. And we see that these two red points are the same, meaning that the decrypted message M prime should be 2L XOR 
the length of n zero bits. And because we only have one block in the message, this directory becomes the checksum. Now this 2n XOR 2 times 3n is 4n because we are using XOR as the addition. Meaning that these two blue points are the same and the output here is indeed M1, M2, XOR, C2. So this T prime here is indeed the correct tag for this ciphertext C prime. And Bob will accept it as valid. And finally, this is returned. This probably means nothing, but still L can be used to reconstruct all the masks, and uh, this can be used for more powerful attacks. And indeed, we have a lot of uh, other attacks. We can forge longer messages. Uh, we now have a universal forgery, a distinguishing attack, and a plain text recovery attack. Uh, we can also simulate the encryption and decryption of the block cipher, even though we don't know the secret key. I will not describe the details how we do these attacks, but let me uh, show you how they uh, look like for some of them. This universal forgery attack, in the minimal forgery, uh, the attack forges this M prime, a message of this particular form. And this, is, this problem means nothing, but in the universal forgery, for any nonce and message possibly chosen by the adversary, the adversary can create the corresponding ciphertext and tag that will be accepted by Bob. So the adversary can send NCT to Bob, and Bob believes that this was generated by Alice. We use the minimal forgery as a subroutine, so we still require Alice to uh, uh, encrypt uh, some specified uh, message, but still this is the worst uh, authentication attack because this could be chosen by the adversary and it can be a malicious uh, contract document or it could be a harmful code if, if Bob is a programmer. And this should be avoided if we use an authenticated encryption scheme. A plain text recovery, it's an attack in terms of privacy. And uh, here we have a message M, which is not known to the adversary initially. Alice encrypts it into CT and uh, sends NCT to Bob. Now by using the minimal forgery as a subroutine, the adversary can recover the entire content of the mes message. So it means that OCB2 does not have the functionality of encryption. All right, OCB2 has a proof of security and uh, we have this uh, list of attacks and let me explain what went wrong with the proof. Um, so this is OCB2, and the technical de specification of OCB2 is, is complex for a direct security proof. So to prove the security of OCB2, uh, the proof uses abstraction of OCB2. So we just put these structures in boxes and we now have this uh, abstracted version of OCB2. If this red box is this structure, this is called XCX because we have XROR, encrypt, and XROR. And this blue box is this structure, which we call XE because we have X, OR, and encrypt. Then we have OCB2, right? This, this is how we define uh, reds and blue boxes. 
if the red box is pi one, which is the ideally secure version of XCX, and if the blue box is pi zero, which is the ideally secure version of XE, then we have something different. And let's call it theta CB2. So there are three steps to uh, prove the security of OCB2. The first step is to prove that theta CB2 is secure. So we focus on this construction where we put the idealized, ideally secure versions, pi one into the red box and pi zero into the blue box. And this part works fine. And the next step is to show that for any tag respecting adversary, XEX construction looks like the ideally secure version, and pi zero look, uh, and XE looks like the ideally secure version. We need some assumption in order to show this indistinguishability, because you see that if we give exactly the same input to this one and this one, then this value here will be here, and the adversary can compute the value of L, and with the knowledge of L, we can do a lot of attacks. So we need some condition in order to show this indistinguishability. But as long as, so the, the condition is called a tag respecting condition, and as, as long as we consider an adversary that respects the condition, this indistinguishability holds, so this is fine. The final step is to combine these two results to conclude that OCB2 is secure. And this step is called a hybrid argument. So what we do is to consider an adversary attacking theta CB2. And we know that the attack doesn't succeed because this is a secure construction. And now we substitute pi one with this structure, XEX, and pi zero with this structure. If this indistinguishability holds for any adversary, this adversary will not notice the substitution, and we can conclude that OCB2 is secure as well. However, it turns out that this adversary can force violating the tag respecting condition, meaning that this indistinguishability result doesn't hold for this adversary attacking theta CB2, because XEX and XE are misused. And this is exactly the point where the security proof of OCB2 failed. So a lesson learned here is that uh, we have to prove all the statements. This part is fine with, with OCB2. And we also have to carefully check that they fit together nicely. And this was not the case in OCB2. Uh, there are some ways to fix OCB2. Uh, we can change the definition uh, so that we use XEX for the last message block. And we have a proof of security for, for this uh, fix. And we can also change the definition of the mask. And uh, this will, we, are plan, we have a plan to include this in uh, an e-print uh, soon. And uh, we also have some potential improved um, uh, options. And of course, it is reasonable to avoid using OCB2. And we could, for instance, use DCM or, 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 or OCB3. OK, a little bit about uh, the timeline. Uh, OCB1, the first version, was proposed at CCS 2001. Uh, the second version was proposed at AJ Crypt 2004, and OCB2 was included in the ISO standard in 2009. 
uh, the final version, the latest version was proposed at FSC 2011, and uh, it is included in IETF RFC in 2014. And it was 14 years since the publication of OCB2 when Inoue and Minematsu found a potential gap in the security proof. They studied the uh, OCB2 paper for the educational purposes and for searching uh, potential improvements in OCB2. They noticed this uh, gap in the proof and initially they tried to fix the proof because they believed that OCB2 is secure. After a month, the fix didn't succeed and uh, they came up with the minimal forgery. They finished writing the paper in two weeks and uh, this was sent to ePrint and the initial version contained minimal forgery, extension to longer messages, almost universal forgery, and it pointed out a gap in the security proof and it proposed a fix of OCB2. The analysis by Inoue and uh, Minematsu focused on the authenticity, security, and Beltram Pottering, he noticed that privacy is also an issue. He, pre uh, he presented a distinguishing attack in two weeks after the publication of Inoue and Minematsu's work. And this means that uh, the ciphertext of OCB2 does not look, ran does not look uh, random. And uh, I read his paper and I noticed that uh, full plain text recovery is possible. I finished my paper in two days and sent it to ePrint. <laughs> and now we have a lot of interesting findings in the next of, uh, couple of days. <laughs> and the security of OCB2 has gone. So we discussed and uh, decided to write a joint paper. <laughs> so there was an exciting competition involving multiple teams from industry and academia, uh, from NEC, Nagoya University, and IBM, and uh, Loyal Holloway, uh, University of London, across different corners in the world. And it took a long time until the first finding of the potential gap in the security proof. But after that, everything happened in a very short period of time. So there is a saying that attacks only get better. I think this was uh, uh, popularized by Bruce Schneier, quoting a word from uh, NSA. For the case of OCB2, attacks got better and powerful very quickly, very quickly. Okay, to uh, conclude, um, OCB2 is broken. And I think it's fair and reasonable to say that OCB2 should not be used in any applications. And a seemingly small flaw and, uh, and the security proof led to surprisingly powerful attacks. And I'd like to remark that our attacks do not apply to OCB 1 and 3 because they do not misuse XCX and XC. And I also would like to uh, remark that the general structure of OCB is still sound. I mean, this um, abstracted version of OCB is still sound. And lessons learned, yes, even the most promising scheme can fail and active uh, third party verification of security proofs is very important. 
That's my talk. Thank you very much. Any questions for Iwata-san? So maybe I have a quick question. Do you think that using automation could have solved this problem, or the verification of uh, proofs by tools? Would that help in this case? Thank you for asking. I think... I think verification tools still need uh, under development. I think it is useful to analyze the security of the abstract version. And I think uh, automated tool can prove the security of, of this level of, uh, of a scheme. But I think there's, we still need uh, some time until we see uh, that the verification tools can handle all the details in the scheme. So uh, I'm not sure if the current verification tool can find the flow uh, in, in, in OCB2. Okay, if there's no further question, let's thank Iwata-san for his talk. Thank, thank you very much. much. Very nice talk. The second and final talk of this session is entitled All on Deck. And it's a talk submitted by the Ketchak team. The Ketchak team consists of uh, Johan Dahmen, Seid Hoffert, Michael Peters, Gilles Van Asch, and Ronnie Van Keer. And unfortunately, Michael Peters and Ronnie Van Keer cannot make it to give the talk, but the other three will do it. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Bart, for this uh, nice introduction. Also, thanks uh, Tetsu Iwata, who gave an uh, intro excellent introduction to what we will talk about here, that I can go a bit faster over uh, certain slides. So, yes, this is a talk about Symmetric Crypto, uh, basically what the Ketchak team has been doing the last couple of years. So you see uh, the usual names, so um, Mikael, Gilles here today, um, myself, this is how you write my name, actually. And... Um, we have, uh, I have the honor to introduce to you Seth Hoffert. So it's um, a person here from the um, US, Nebraska, uh, who sent us some mails a few years ago. And he had very uh, relevant uh, comments and very good remarks. He found, I think, uh, somewhere a minor flaw in the specification of Kiak. And uh, he sent a few very interesting mails. And then we decided to incorporate him into the team. But we never met. We always. Uh, we're communicating by mail and, and Git and so on and uh, conf call. And we met him yesterday for the first time and he will now help us present this thing. So I will give uh, Seth the scene. Then uh, Seth will speak about modes of our newly proposed function that's called the DAC function, hence the title. And Jill will talk about how to build a DAC function. So, yeah. Um, what we uh, want to do is symmetric crypto, and uh, we kind of highlight authenticate encryption in this talk. So it's uh, thanks to Tetsu, you all know what that is. So we look at more like a generalized version where there is um, a message consists of plain text that uh, needs to be encrypted and associated data that is data that should also be authenticated but not encrypted. So the message. Uh, is uh, plain text associated data, and you encrypt a cryptogram consisting of the encrypted plain text, which is the cipher text, the associated data, and a tag. And uh, this is done under a secret key that is shared by encryptor and decryptor, and a diversifier uh, that should be a nonce. Okay, so how is that typically done? Uh, nowadays, like a good example of this would be OCB2. It's a two-layer approach where uh, first you build a, an n-bit block cipher, uh, like uh, AES, for instance. And um, the goal of that block cipher is that if you instantiate it with a secret and unknown key that is uniformly select from the space of possible keys, it should behave like a random permutation. So a permutation, uh, random permutation, kind of a theoretical idea that you could select a permutation from the space of all possible n-bit permutations. And we can quantify the, um, the security of a block cipher by uh, specifying the advantage of distinguishing the block cipher from such a permutation by an attacker that could query the thing but doesn't know what it is. 
and the M corresponds to the number of queries he can make, so it's kind of the data complexity of an attacker, the data resources he has, and N is the computational resources. And we generally assume this epsilon, this, this distinguishing advantage to be very small. We cannot prove it's small, but we can rely on a crypt analyst to show uh, an attack, and an attack would be something that shows this is not small, so a practical attack or a theoretical attack. So we cannot prove it, but we can rely on the cryptographic community to try to break it, and as time goes on, we get more confidence. And then we build, actually, a mode that uses a random permutation, and there we can actually proof bound. So that would be like OCB2 and uh, OCB, you can, or the theta CB, you can prove a bound uh, based on the, it's, it's like a probabilistic bound based on the randomness of the random permutation. So that's really something rigorous that you can prove with probabilistic techniques, while um, the block cipher you can only assume it's okay and account on public uh, scrutiny. And then you instantiate um, this, this mode with a concrete block cipher and by the hybrid argument or the triangle inequality you get that the breaking probability is upper bound by the sum of the two epsilons, the two advantages. Uh, one of the one in blue so is the one you can prove and the one in red is the one you can um, only rely on by public scrutiny. So that's how it works. So this has a number of problems. Uh, so the first problem is that um, sometimes these modes are quite complex most of the time and uh, so computer scientists may trip over them. And I think the previous talk gave a good example and uh, that the complexity of the mode didn't help in getting the proof correct. Um, but there are many other examples. Uh, the second is the birthday bound. <coughs> so as soon as the amount of data that you encrypt with a given key approaches um, two to the power n divided by two, where n is the block length, you get into trouble. And for triple deaths, this is 32 gigabytes, so it's a lot, but not, um, not uh, astronomical. And you can uh, have a look at the site on Suite 32 attack for some uh, discussion. So it's a very interesting site. Uh, for AES, it's quite far away. That's 2 to the power of 64 blocks. But it still kind of stands in the way of when you want to claim 128 bits of security. This 2 to the power of 64 is kind of annoying. So it would be nice to get rid of it. Uh, the, the third point is that actually is more philosophical, is that uh, block ciphers address not necessarily the correct design goal. So first of all, when you build a block cipher, you want to make the inverse operation. So in ECB, uh, when you un will want to uncover the penguin again, you want to make that efficient. While many modern modes don't use it. Uh, you build a block cipher to be PRP secure, so to be hard to distinguish from a random permutation, but what most modes really want is to be hard to distinguish from a random transformation, a PRF. And the modes have actually a high complexity because the block cipher is fixed length and the messages are variable length. Okay, so let's take a look at what we can do about it. And there's two directions. But first I need to look at what a block cipher, um, how it's structured. It's basically, it's an n-bit permutation parameterized by a side input key. Yeah? So you can actually depict it like this. Now you get this... Uh, block cipher in the middle, uh, the data path, and this is where the key comes in. And the encryption data path is just iterating a simple round function, and each round typically takes a key, or a key is injected every few rounds, and that comes from a key schedule. So how could we make the, turn this into something more useful? Well, one way of doing it is by adding a side input. So ex we extend the block cipher to a so-called tweakable block cipher, and then we get this image. So in comes the key, the data in, data out, key, tweak. And that gives you a permutation parameterized by uh, the joint key and tweak. And this tweak is very useful because it allows you to simplify mode. So if you would do ECB, you could just uh, use a different tweak for each block and the penguin would be invisible because you basically encrypt each block with a different permutation. 
And also making this tweak unique uh, per call avoids the birthday bump. So that kind of solves the issue. But of course, it makes your block cipher also a more complex thing. The other direction is uh, trimming the block cipher. So we dump the side parameters, which means we dump the key, we dump the tweak. Well, it wasn't there in the block cipher in the first place. And it gives us a B bit permutation. That you get this no side input, just straight ahead. So this moves your birthday bound to two to the power B over two. You can say, well, if B is N, you don't win anything, but you can make actually B larger than N for the same resources. And you have to deal with the key uh, one layer up. So I want to thank uh, Bart Menning for coming up with this idea of uh, traffic science. Okay. So what does permutation-based crypto look like? Well, at least for keyed uh, constructions. There's a, now the two-layer approach of block cipher-based crypto is replaced by a three-layer approach. First, we build a permutation, just a simple round function that we iterate. And then we construct yeah, uh, a new kind of primitive, which I will for the moment call FK, on top of it. And this new kind of primitive has uh, arbitrary length input and output, and some more properties. Um, and then you... Um, try to build it in such a way that the distinguishing it from a random oracle is, uh, is hard. So it has a very small advantage. And the assurance is, again, built on public scrutiny, so on cryptanalysis. So the cryptanalysis, in this case, is not applied to the permutation. It's applied to the construction taking a particular permutation. And then we build a mode on top of a random oracle. And often these modes are so simple that the bound for the proof becomes trivial. And finally, the security we get is just, again, the sum of the two epsilons. So now uh, Seth will explain how we can use uh, 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 this kind of function to build useful modes, and then Jill will explain how to build such a uh, function. So what is this new mysterious kind of primitive that Yon is referring to? We call this a deck function. DEC function stands for doubly extendable cryptographic keyed function. A DEC function accepts as input a sequence of one or more variable length bit strings and returns as output a variable length bit string. Now this output string has the property of being a pseudo-random function of all the input strings. In other words, it behaves like a random oracle. And as far as notation and terminology goes, we say that we input strings x1 through xm into the DEC function requesting n bits of output starting from offset q. Deck functions are incremental. This means that if you calculate a deck function over string x and the later over string x, strings x and y, you can reuse the contribution of string x. You need not pay for x again. You just have to pay for string y. You say pick up where you left off, essentially. This applies to the output as well. So if you request n one bits from offset zero, and then from that point forward request n two additional bits, you don't need to pay for those n1 bits from before you just pay for the additional bits. So again, picking up where you left off. We believe that the deck function abstraction is the ideal abstraction for building a very wide range of keyed symmetric crypto modes. And this seems like a bold claim. I mean, how do we go about doing this? Well, let's start simple. So stream cipher, for example. So we can see here, we simply take the nonce string, input it into the deck function, and request as many key stream bits as needed to encrypt the plain text and, and obtain the ciphertext. Pretty simple. How about a message authentication code? In this example, we simply take the message plain text, input it into the deck function, and request as output the t-bit authentication tag t. So these modes were simple to implement on top of deck functions thanks to the fact that they support variable length input and variable length output. But what about something more complicated such as an authenticated encryption mode? This takes us to DEC SANE. SANE stands for Session Authentication Non-Spaced Encryption. The central idea behind this mode is to exchange a sequence of messages between a sender and a receiver, calculating an authentication tag after each message. Each authentication tag actually authenticates all of the messages up to that point in the session. And so if any message is dropped, reordered, duplicated, or tampered with in any way, the authentication tag won't match. You can detect this and then drop the session immediately. In addition, we support the notion of a startup tag, T0. This tag authenticates the key nonce pair that was used to initialize the session. 
And so the nice thing about this is that if, for example, an adversary tries to initially initiate a session with the server, the adversary hopefully doesn't know the secret key and therefore cannot calculate the tag correctly. The server can then terminate the session immediately before any data is encrypted, thereby saving precious server resources. But how do we actually implement a mode like this on top of deck functions? So diving into it, we, initializing, we initialize a session by taking the nonce n, inputting it into the deck function, and requesting the tbit startup tag t0. To encipher a message, we first start by requesting keystream bits from the deck function immediately following the tag from the previous message, encrypting the plain text and obtaining ciphertext C1. We then authenticate the metadata and ciphertext strings by inputting them into the deck function and then request a t-bit authentication tag T1. Now I'd like to note here that thanks to the incrementality property of deck functions, we're able to actually reuse the contribution of all the past messages into the deck function, which at this point is just the nonce. So we don't have to pay for that string input again, we just reuse it. And this is really what makes the session mode work. So to encipher another message, we again request key stream bits, immediately following the tag of the previous message, encrypting the plain text and obtaining ciphertext C2, and then we authenticate the metadata and ciphertext strings by inputting them into the deck function and requesting the authentication tag as output. Again, we can see that we get, the, we get to reuse the contribution of all the previous messages for free here. One thing to note about this mode is that it is a nonce-based mode. So this means if, if you reuse a nonce, then keystream gets reused, which leaks information about the plain text. So obviously don't reuse a nonce. But this begs the question, is it possible to design an authenticated encryption mode that is robust against nonce reuse? And the answer is yes. That takes me to the next mode, which is DEC SANS. This mode stands for session authentication synthetic nonce encryption. To encipher a message in this mode, we start by authenticating the metadata and plain text strings by in inputting them into the DEC function and requesting t-bit authentication tag t1. And then we calculate the key stream as a function of the metadata and the authentication tag, encrypting the plain text and obtaining ciphertext C1. So again, I'd like to note here that thanks to the incrementality property, we need only calculate the contribution of metadata string A1 once in the authentication tag step, and then we can reuse that contribution in the keystream step. This benefit will become apparent in the next message. So to encipher the next message, we again authenticate the metadata and plain text strings, obtaining authentication tag T2, and then we calculate the keystream as a function of the metadata and the authentication tag, obtaining ciphertext C2. So the important thing to note here is that the authentication tag material and the keystream material are actually functions of not only the current message, but all of the messages up to this point in the session. And one benefit of this is that even if you have a pair of tags that collide, but if you do have a pair of tags that collide between sessions, then um, as long as the histories are unique, then the keystream will be unique as well. So it's kind of like an additional diversification, kind of an extra layer of security. And then we repeat this process as many times as needed for as many messages as we wish to exchange. So one thing important to note about Civ-based modes or Civ-like modes in general is that they don't give you optimal expansion. So for t-bits of security, you'll generally need to use a two t-bit tag and in addition, neither this mode nor the previous mode are robust against the release of unverified plain text from the decipher oracle. So meaning your decipher oracle absolutely needs to verify the authenticity before releasing any plain text. It can't leak any information out about the plain text. So this begs the question, is it possible to design an authenticated encryption mode that is robust to nonce reuse, robust to uh, release of unverified plain text from the decipher oracle and offers optimal expansion? And of course the answer is yes. This takes me to the final mode, DEC WBC. So this is a tweakable wide block cipher built on top of DEC functions and a Feistel network configuration. And one of the nice things about this mode is that the first and last rounds need not be full-blown pseudorandom functions. They need only be differentially uniform. In addition, they need only output a single block. So as a whole, this mode performs two read passes and one write pass over the data, making it pretty efficient for what it gives you. I mean, this is great because it gives us a variable with block cipher, but how do we build an authenticated encryption mode on top of this? So the sender takes the message plain text, appends some kind of verifiable redundancy to it, runs this through the wide block cipher, obtaining the cryptogram, 
the receiver takes the cryptogram, runs it through the reverse direction of the wide block cipher, obtaining the plain text with the um, uh, redundancy attached to it. And then the receiver validates that the zero bits are intact. And if so, the message is authentic. And we handle the metadata by plugging that into the tweak input of the block cipher. So if metadata is tampered with, the mapping of the block cipher changes, and inevitably, the redundancy is damaged. Um, this mode gives us uh, robustness against nonce reuse, robustness against release of unverified plain text from the decipher oracle, and it gives us optimal expansion. So this means that for t bits of redundancy, you'll get t bits of authenticity in general. And not only this, but we can actually take advantage of redundancy that may already be present in the plain text. So if you're enciphering network packets, for example, you may have a 16-bit checksum available to you, in which case, as long as you validate that checksum in the decipher oracle, you've just achieved 16 bits of authenticity. So this mode is very powerful, very robust. And now, Jill will talk about how to build deck functions. So I will um, briefly explain two ways to, to build a, a deck function. Both, both ways are based on permutations. The first one is more serial approach and the other one is a parallelizable approach. So for the serial approach, uh, we base ourselves on the keyed duplex construction. And so as a refresher, we start from the sponge construction, which is used in Ketchak and Chatri. Um, and then the duplex construction is kind of the dual of a sponge construction. It's cryptographically equivalent to sponge but we add incrementality, so we can add uh, input blocks and get output blocks uh, all the way. Then part of the input can be a key, and then we move to the keyed version. So concretely, uh, the key duplex, a key duplex object looks like this. We have a, a state that is the same size as the permutation, and it's initialized with a secret key. Then between the application of the permutation, we can get a, a block of output, and we can absorb a block of input, and, and we can repeat that as many times as we want. So as such, it doesn't, give, it doesn't give us a deck function because of the restrictions on the input and output sizes, but uh, we can easily put a thin layer on top of this and then expand it into a full-blown deck function. Uh, one example is a strobe framework uh, by Mike Hamburg. Um, as soon as you initialize strobe with the secret key, then, then it can implement an, a deck function. And the same goes for our uh, submission to the nice lightweight crypto competition called Zodiac. Another way is the parallelizable um, approach, and for this we rely on the Farfalle construction. So the Farfalle construction looks like this. I'm not going to um, go into the details, I just wish to point out that it has a secret key input, then an, an input made of blocks, and all these blocks will be treated by, by the permutation in a way that they can be vectorized. All these permutations are computed at the same time, so you can have uh, a significant speed up by having a vectorized implementation. And the same goes for the output. You can also compute all these uh, permutations at the same time. Okay, so we instantiated the Farfalle construction with two concrete deck functions. The first one is called Cravate, which just take the Farfalle construction and plug in um, the Ketchak permutation, just we reduced it to six rounds. Um, this gives us um, a deck function for which we target a security of at least 128 bits, and that includes also um, adversaries equipped with a quantum computer. Um, I will give some performance figures for Kravate, so it's, it's quite fast, but the one ad disadvantage of Kravate is that it has a block size of 200 bytes, which is quite big, so we wanted to reduce this block size and we designed, sorry, the um, Zudu permutation. So the Zudu permutation is a 384-bit permutation. Um, it can be represented as 12 words of 32 bits, so that fits nicely in, for instance, the registers of an ARM processor. Uh, so it's the size of the Gimli permutation, but with the design philosophy of Ketchak. And Zoof is the deck function built on top of Zudu. Uh, so we, again, target 128 bits of security for Zoof um, as far as uh, adversaries, uh, I don't know many of them, but for those adversaries who have a quantum computer, in that case, um, we target at least 96 bits of security because it's a smaller permutation. Okay, so um, I promise to give some uh, performance figures. So Cravate um, on the Skylake processors, Skylake, uh, I'm sorry, on the Skylake processor, Cravate is slightly faster than the AES encounter mode. 
Um, bear in mind that this processor has the ASNI permutation, so it has a hardware implementation of the AS, whereas Kabate uses only general purpose vector instructions. Um, ZOOF has a smaller granularity, so 48 bytes uh, of, of block size. Another advantage of, of ZOOF is that it fits nicely on different platforms, so it has good performances from small to big uh, platforms. So I start with the small ARM Cortex-M0 processor, and you can see that it's about four to five times faster than the AS in counter mode. The same goes for the Cortex-M3. On Skylake, it's slightly, slightly slower than the AES, but as soon as you have um, access to the AVX512 instruction set, then it again becomes faster than the AES. Um, so that, that's it for the presentation. To conclude, so we presented a way um, to maybe refactor symmetric crypto, at least for the GID um, operations, and we do that by proposing a new API, a new kind of interface called the DEC function, and we think that this way of working puts the safety margin at the right place, meaning that we can, from there, build things that are quite efficient. Uh, we show the performance of Kravate and, and Zoof as showcases. Um, something I didn't mention, but we believe that Kravate and Zoof have actually conservative safety margins. Um, and yeah, the only thing I wanted to mention is that besides the good performance in uh, software, uh, they have a high potential in, when it comes to um, hardware implementations. And to finish, if you are interested in permutation-based crypto, we actually are organizing a workshop collocated with Eurocrit code permutation-based crypto. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Serge. Uh, I'd like to know what is a security notion for a deck function. It's a BRF, so with variable length input output uh, under a given key. So it's like a PRP, but then a BRF. Um, you used uh, cycles per second as a uh, benchmark measurement, um, but the uh, but you used AVX two for um, your deck construction, and that. Uh, re I think reduces the um, the clock speed of the CPU. So, uh, do you have benchmarks, or do, does this also outperform AES in just absolute time? Okay, so at, at least we disable the Turbo Boost feature, which means that these should be actual cycles. Now, it's true that I heard that at least for AVX five twelve, um, there is some kind of decrease of the whole, the whole speed when, when you use that, that feature. Yeah, that, these aspects I don't, I don't actually know. Um, my, my point is more, this really has potential when you have such vector instructions. That's really the point uh, we're trying to make. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, still on the subject of uh, Zoof, uh, you compared to AES128 on Cortex-M0, uh, I would have been interested to see the, the numbers with respect to, for example, Chata 20 or Sasa 20, which are actually extremely quick on those platforms. Yes, we, we, don't, we don't have figures for Chacha. We, we, we are aware that, of course, Chacha is quite um, um, performant as well. Uh, I think when it comes to hardware implementations, um, Zoof has actually uh, much more potential than, than Chacha. Thank you. Perhaps I missed it, but in the deck presentation, you're working with a stream of messages such that if one message was lost, um, the receiver would not be able to do the, the decryption. But then uh, when you got to uh, um, Kratzik and, and Zoo, it seemed like you switched now to a block um, cipher mode such that uh, um, such risks were not uh, um, um, operational situations, not apparent. Uh, is that correct? That, that Though the underlying deck is a session stream, but the, what you're building on top of it is a block, and this can be used in an environment where lost messages is uh, not an issue. So the, the deck function abstraction is really, it's an incremental abstraction. So 
the session concept is kind of implemented on top of that. So um, the fact that like Dexane and Dexance had that built into the mode, that, that was kind of a mode specific design requirement. So we could do the same thing here with DuckWBC simply by placing a chaining value into the tweak. Like you could take a truncation of the plain text plus the ciphertext, say take the first 32 bytes and then put that in as the, into the, the next block's tweak as a chaining value and that, that would kind of simulate a session mode with the wide block separate construct. So you can build a session mode various different ways. So, uh, and not use a session mode when it's not appropriate. Correct. Yep. Good. Thank you. So I have a related question about these um, funky new um, modes that you're building, these kind of like online streaming modes. Um, have you done, or what can you say about the security analysis you've done of these modes? So you start with something that's a PRF or a PRP, um, but now you've got this kind of complex sequence of messages which could be reordered by the adversary or dropped messages by the adversary. So have you done all the analysis of that? And what models did you use? So, yeah, I mean, we, all this is just based on the deck function behaving like a, a PRF. So, I mean, as long as the domain separation is correct. So you can see this is why I use frame bits in this mode. So, like, I'm putting a zero bit after the metadata, and then I'm putting a zero one after the plain text. So that kind of domain separates all these strings. So that if, they, if the adversary tried to take, uh, you know, two separate messages and combine them into one or whatever, it, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work because the frame bits would prevent that. So that's sure. kind of... That's kind of how we went about designing these modes. But do you have, I mean, are you using like a stateful authenticated encryption security notion and you're proving that it meets that or um, something like that? Or there's like uh, streaming modes, there's um, different, there are different models that you could use to prove security of, of this thing as a secure channel. Sure, yeah, I guess you could say that we're just using the fact that, like in this example, the authentication takes a function of all the previous messages and this message. So it's just, it, it'd be as if we input all these strings in when we enciphered this message, but we're just reusing those contributions from the previous message, so, I, yeah. Okay, I, I guess we'll take it offline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's no more questions, let's, um, I've got a question. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Sorry, oh, sorry. cool. Um, you talked at the, right at the start of the talk about relying on cryptanalysis by the community to give you assurance of certain things, and the previous talk showed that that didn't work very well for a while, and then suddenly did work very well. So aside from, you know, obvious things like making sure papers are widely available, do you have any thoughts on best practices for getting that assurance of, from the cryptographic community? That's a good question, of course. I think uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, to specify a clear security claim and then try to provoke people in trying to prove that's wrong. That's, yeah, that's the only thing we can do. Uh, yeah. And to make the things as attractive to attack as possible. So proposing uh, reduced round versions and so on. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're now done. So let's thank both speakers of the session. Dr. Hoot of the session, thank you. slides. Good. Sure. What? Aha, fantastic. We're on. All right. So now we're going to switch gears and, and uh, switch to the celebratory part of, uh, of the event. Um, and we're going to be awarding our annual uh, Real World uh, Left Chain Prize Awards. Uh, actually, before I do that, just a quick announcement. Somebody lost a bracelet, so if anybody is missing a bracelet, uh, it'll be right here and you can pick it up during the break. Otherwise, if anybody wants a bracelet, <laughs> there's one here. Okay, so I'll leave it right here. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So like I said, this is a fun part of the, of the event, uh, awarding the Lev Chin Prize uh, Award for Real World Crypto. So this prize uh, honors basically major innovations in the field of cryptography that have had a significant real-world impact, and we really mean real-world impact here. Um, so the award uh, is, is funded by uh, Max Levchin. Maybe, many of you have probably heard of Max Levchin. He's the founder of, of PayPal and has done lots of other things. He's been a very strong supporter of cryptography uh, throughout his life. 
Um, back in 2016, or maybe even 2015, we approached him about creating a new prize. Uh, we told him that we'd like to award uh, $10,000 um, annually for uh, work on real-world cryptography. Max immediately said, yes, I'll support it. So we said, you have to support it for at least 20 years. And he said, yes, I'll support it. Uh, so then we said, well, we want to give two awards per year. And he said, yes, I'll support that too. So that's why we're able, that's why we're able to, to, to give two awards every year. Um, let's see. So just the uh, previous award winners since 2016, as you can see, these are all very prestigious members of our, uh, of our community. So I'm very happy that we're able to recognize their phenomenal contributions. You can kind of read their names um, uh, for yourself, but I think you'd all agree these are amazing, amazing results. Um, I was very happy that last year we were able to recognize all the work that went into TLS uh, 1.3, as we heard earlier today, um, very, had an enormous impact on, on the world. Okay, so with that, uh, I guess I should just say that the, the prize itself comes with a $10,000 check. I have two checks here. Um, and uh, it comes also with a trophy. The trophy itself is a cryptex, so, yeah, so the award winner has to figure out the secret password to open up the cryptex, and then they can hide things inside of their cryptex um, for future generations to find. Okay, so with that, uh, let's award the 2020 uh, Levchin Prize. So, the first uh, award, drum roll, the first award, thank you, thank you. Uh, the first award goes to someone who is world-renowned and very, very well-recognized in his community. Uh, and the award goes to uh, Ralph Merkel. <laughs> so Ralph, I'm going to ask you to please come up, come up on stage. Uh, so the award recognizes Ralph's amazing contributions to the development of uh, public key cryptography, to hash algorithms, to things we call Merkel trees now, and of course, to digital, digital signatures, Ralph, uh, in, of course, made enormous contributions to hash-based signatures. Before I hand it over to Ralph to say a few, a few uh, words, there's one thing that I wanted to show you. So this is, his, this is Ralph's project proposal uh, as an undergraduate student, undergraduate student, uh, back in 1974. This is an amazing thing to read. Um, I often use this as an example showing that undergraduate students can do absolutely amazing and stunning uh, can have amazing and stunning ideas. Let's just read this quickly. It says, the project that he proposed as part of this course is establishing secure communications between separate secure sites over insecure communication lines. This is back in 1974. No prior arrangements have been made between the two sites, and it is assumed that any information known at either site is known to the enemy. The sites, however, are now secure, and any, informa any further information will not be divulged. Yeah, you can pretty much see the, inner, the, the makings of public key cryptography in this project proposal. Again, it's amazing. This is back in 1974, before anyone had any inclination uh, about any of this work. So it just goes to show that undergraduate students can do amazing things. And by the way, it's interesting to hear the professor's comments. So the professor wrote up, up there, well, this is project number one, but your project number two actually seems much more reasonable. Um, and maybe, well, maybe I'll, I'll skip the rest of it, but basically saying, maybe you should work on something else. This is maybe not going to go anywhere. Fortunately, Mark didn't, uh, Ralph didn't listen, and uh, we now have public key crypto as a, as a result. So congratulations, Ralph. <laughs> Let's go. First of all, this is your... All right, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And this brings back nostalgic memories of CS244. That was a quarter project. I recall proposing a quarter project and being disappointed that I was not able to work on public key cryptography for my quarter project, of course, we didn't have the word back then, so I had to describe what it was I was working on, and of course it was regarded as, well, not, not exactly something that anyone would be able to do. I did drop the course because the professor was not um, supportive of the work at that point in time, but I did go on and try to submit it for publication in the communications of the ACM. And as I recall, when I submitted it for publication, 
Um, two of the three referees seemed to think it was okay. The third referee, who the editor said was uh, very, very well versed in cryptography and a very senior person in the field, described it as uh, not in keeping with current cryptographic thinking. And so it was rejected for quite some time. Uh, I, I persisted, of course, because if a senior person in the field rejected it and thought it was not in keeping with current cryptographic thinking, that meant it was a new idea. So that meant I was on the right track, and it also meant that because I had submitted it, if I eventually got it published, they'd have to publish it with the original submission date. And so I figured I'd just hang in there, and eventually they'd recognize it and realize that it was a good paper. And that's how it turned out. It turned out I had to hang in there until after New Directions was published, at which point suddenly the responses from the referees became things like, oh, yeah, this is, this is a good idea. You should publish it. Uh, but it did require three years, as I recall, before it eventually got published. So I have a question. How many of you have noticed that when you submit things to committee-based review, in particular, when you submit new ideas to committee-based reviews, sometimes one member of the committee doesn't understand this. Have, have people noticed this problem? Any, 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 I, I hear laughter. Uh, I take it that people have understood this. So if I might point out, this might be an, something where some reform would be helpful. So if some better process than committee-based review for new ideas was developed, and I have a horrible proposal, and the horrible proposal is, why don't we submit concepts for something better than committee-based review to the committee-based review process, <laughs> and then inch our way upwards, because we have a process in place for evaluating new ideas, an imperfect process, but we can use that imperfect process to develop better ways of dealing with new ideas. And given that what we have in place for reviewing new ideas is both imperfect, but we've got it in place, then we use that process to develop something better. So if I can make that modest proposal, then perhaps that would be helpful across the whole range of areas where we are looking at new ideas with the committee-based process. And I think there are a lot of areas where that takes place. And this is based not only on my experience, but I think on the experience of a lot of other people who dealt with this particular problem. So that's one thing. The other thing is, how many people have heard of Merkle trees? Yeah, okay. How many people have heard of Merkle puzzles? Oh, that's, that's rather surprising. It's a fair number of you have heard of Merkle puzzles. So Merkle puzzles were the first public key crypto system invented uh, back in 1974, as you've just heard. And Merkle trees actually were developed a little later when I was working on my PhD thesis and seem to be somewhat robust, and I think they're robust because they're based on hash functions, and hash functions are resistant to attack by quantum computers. So I just thought I'd put in a brief plug for, you know, things that are resistant to quantum computers are a good idea because the quantum computers are coming and we need to be prepared for that. And right now, NIST is running some very nice competitions and we actually have in place some quantum resistant digital signatures. And I mention that because I did work on that in my PhD thesis many years ago. So that, that area is actually looking pretty good. So if some of you want to work on quantum resistant systems for digital signatures and for authentication, that area is a good one to start work on. The public key distribution is still in process, but I gather that the, the issue now is exactly when should we agree on the 
public key quantum resistance systems, should we do it in you know, the next year or two or the next three or four years, how fast should we go ahead and do that? So that seems like it's on track. So that's basically all I wanted to say was the quantum computers are coming, so we need to prepare for that. And thank you very much for this very, very nice award and the recognition of work that was done on public key cryptography actually a, a fair, fairly long time ago at this point. So thank you very much for, for this very kind recognition of work in this area. Thank you very much. Yeah, congratulations, Ralph, and thank you for all your work. All right, so like I said, we always have two awards uh, to give out. And so the second award this year is uh, going to go uh, in the air, is actually in the area of hash functions to uh, uh, Xi Yun Wang and Mark Stevens. Mark, can you please come up, come on stage, please? <laughs> so Professor Wang actually couldn't be here because of visa issues, uh, but uh, Mark is here to accept the award on, on behalf of both of the winners. So this is recognizing work on groundbreaking contributions to the security of collision-resistant hash functions. And I'm sure you've all heard of this amazing result that actually showed that this hash function that was used for many, many years, actually decades, SHA-1, is now broken and should never be used again. Well, that's all thanks to the work of, uh, Mar of starting from the work of Professor Wang, going all the way to the work of uh, Mark Stevens and, and others as well. So congratulations again, Mark, and looking forward to your, ah. your, your remarks. And don't lose this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just have a, a few words. Um, of course, I want to, to thank uh, the committee uh, for, for, for selecting uh, both of us uh, for this award um, um, uh, on, on the hash function from cryptanalysis. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Max Levchin for, for making this award uh, available. Uh, of course, also congratulations to, to Ralph Merkel uh, for uh, uh, also winning this award. And I, actually, I was really surprised to, to be a, a winner, uh, but, but I'm very proud uh, to be one. And uh, I'm also very proud to win it together with uh, Xiao Yong Wang, and, which unfortunately could not uh, be here uh, today. But uh, she started really everything, right? She started in, uh, in 2004 and, and five with uh, the first uh, collision attacks uh, on, on MD5 um, uh, and, and Xiao Wang. Uh, and that really created uh, a lot of interest and, and research uh, into hash functions and also hash function cryptanalysis uh, in, in particular. Um, and there was a, there's a, a very large area. So um, uh, our work uh, is shattered, that, that builds on, on a, uh, a long line of work and our works uh, do not really stand alone. And I, I want to thank uh, all the people that have uh, contributed. For me personally, my involvement uh, started uh, uh, slightly bit later than an undergraduate uh, project. Uh, I started my uh, master thesis uh, looking at the brand new MD5 uh, collision and just trying to, to, to learn a bit more, but th that uh, went uh, a whole lot uh, further than that in the end. I mean, it really has started my, my career in, in real-world uh, cryptanalysis, I would like to call it, eh? cryptanalysis with a direct impact in, uh, in the real world. And there's been a, a long line of, of research in, in generating, uh, developing uh, newer and better attacks. Uh, and more importantly, also demonstrating real world threat scenarios. I mean, there has been a real demand for such demonstrations to get MD5 and Xiaowan actually deprecated in applications, as so far as we consider that success, successful. And of course, it started with uh, the first MD5 collision. Uh, already then, that was very costly. It was generated on a, on a supercomputer, uh, and it was only a, a meaningless collision, just uh, uh, two message blocks. And so there was an immediate call for, like, yeah, how, how threatening is this? It's just uh, a meaningless, uh, it's very costly. So uh, uh, this really started uh, the research, also my research, in, into faster and, and better attacks and producing meaningful collisions. And this led to the first chosen prefix collision attack on MD5 and demonstrating colliding certificates. 
although even then uh, the demonstration was not enough and we had to provide more demonstrations because uh, uh, this danger was not fully appreciated and some certificate authorities still continue to use uh, MD5. So two years later on, uh, this led to, to the to Rogue CA uh, project. Um, well, we first needed to build uh, a, a better attack that really worked within the constraints to, to, to uh, deploy this attack in, in the real world. And then we had to demonstrate it uh, by actually creating uh, the Rogue CA uh, using a bunch of PlayStation 3s. But that, that finally uh, really made the, the impact and we got certificate authorities to uh, stop using MV5. And there's actually a very similar story for, for SHA-1. Um, of course, the main work went into improving attacks until it could be run practically, right? Shattered was 2017, there was the first practical attack, but uh, uh, already in 2005, we had the first theoretical attack. It took uh, 12 years to, uh, to finally make it run practical. And, and tomorrow we'll even see the first uh, practical Xiaowan collision attack, uh, chosen prefix collision attack. Uh, for for Xiaowan, the main uh, downside still remains the cost. So the main threat either has to be a, a, a high-value target uh, or collisions have to be reusable, meaning that uh, we can amortize the cost of the, these uh, very costly uh, SHA-1 attacks over many targets. And I think uh, we already did this with uh, the, the shattered uh, attack. We created prefixes for PDF files, and now you can just, with a snap of a finger, generate uh, arbitrary colliding PDFs with uh, different uh, uh, contents. Um, and further, that has not really been done for Xiaowan, but luckily we have many examples for, for MD5, uh, and hopefully uh, uh, this, this uh, grows uh, also for, for Xiaowan. And really, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to end, I really want to say that we need more efforts in, uh, in real-world crypt analysis, and in particular, demonstrating real-world uh, threats and spending uh, quite a bit of uh, effort in there because there's a real demand for that uh, to really make some change. So uh, I think the work still continues uh, as long as uh, Xiaowan is uh, still used. And I basically want to, to end with it. So I want to thank uh, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being uh, given this award. And uh, uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone. Mark, 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 you forgot the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yeah, thank you for your work. This has been obviously very impactful work, so thank you for, for doing it. Okay, so just to conclude, I want to mention that uh, we are always looking for good nominations for the uh, award winners for next year. If you go to the award site, it's off of the, Art of the Real World Crypto website, there's a very simple nomination process. All you have to do is just type in the nominee your name and a brief description of why you think they, they, deserve, they, need, uh, they deserve the award, and we'll take your nomination into consideration. So please nominate people. This really helps us uh, in choosing the winners. And yeah, so I'll end here, and we'll do this again next year. And I guess now we have a lunch break. Yes, so uh, enjoy the conference, everyone. Thank you.